Well, good morning. So I know we've been sitting for a while, so if you do need to stand up and stretch, that's perfectly fine with me. All right, so we did combine the two presentations, um, but I'm going to go ahead and just take a Take, a, take over where Dr. Davis has left off, but as you can see from the information that uh, Dr. Davis shared with us, this is happening internationally, it's happening at the national level, and it's happening across the state, but from our perspective, um, we want to know what's actually happening here in Gaston County. So for those of us that have been working with the different entities related to this, back in as early as in 2010, 2012, um, we started noticing some alarming trends that were happening across various sectors in the community. So we do a community health survey, and the latest one that was done in 2015, one out of four people who answered that survey said that they had used a drug, that they had used illegal drugs. So you may ask, what's an illegal drug? Well, basically, that's any drug that was not prescribed to you. So when Dr. Davis mentioned that um, we hoard medications, whether it's antibiotics. I mean, antibiotic, you know, medications cost a lot. So our natural tendency is to put them in our medicine cabinet just in case we need them later. Well, unfortunately, so look around the room. That's roughly two people at each table here have used a drug that was not prescribed to them. Over the 15 years from 1999 to 2014, Gaston County had the fourth highest number of heroin overdoses and the highest number of prescription opioid overdoses. Gaston County, again, um, in 2014 to 15, we were the second highest, uh, we had the second highest number of meth lab bust. And then our prescribers in the community, not only are we writing for a lot of opioids, but we're also writing for a lot of combination prescriptions so that patients were taking combinations that put them more at risk for having an overdose. Community Care of North Carolina is the case management entity that looks at uh, North Carolina Medicaid data. And there are, I think, 14 networks across the state. And of those 14 networks, our network is Gaston and Lincoln County. We led the state in the highest rates of hospital discharges and emergency room admissions due to acute poisonings. Acute poisonings is the official term for um, overdoses. So we're gonna start sharing some data with you. So like we said, um, there is a lot of data out there and you can easily search for information online about what's happening at the national level and the state level. But when you are looking at how to take care of any problem that's happening in your own backyard, you need to know what the statistics are in your community. Um, so we're gonna walk you through a few um, slides that are going to give you an overview about what's happening in North Carolina and then how does Gaston County compare to that. So as we said, um, our prescribers do write for a lot of um, prescription opioids, and this is a trend over what we have seen since 2012. So this is the number of individual um, opioid pills that were issued in Gaston County. And with most of these slides, you're gonna see that most of our activity peaked in 2015 and that we're starting to see a little bit of a downward trend. Um, and again, if this slide here tells you of all the prescriptions that were filled, per person, how many were averaged in the county. So in North Carolina, on average, there were 66 opioid pills prescribed per resident. In Gaston County, we were at 94. So again, way above the average when it comes to that. So again, if you could imagine everybody in this room, on average, there was 94 pills dispensed per person across the county. So I shared this with you. So this comes from the North Carolina Injury and Violence Prevention Branch. So a lot of the data we're gonna see now, we're gonna be compared to either our peers um, or to the state. Gaston County falls in region four. So that's just the way, so that's the green section that's actually on the slide here. So this slide depicts the number of outpatient opioid pills dispensed by county. So again, this is gonna be specific to Gaston County. So in North Carolina, like we had just said with the other slide, on average, there are 66 pills per resident, but in Gaston County in 2016, that was about 95 pills per resident. The more pills there are, the more likely you are to have overdoses. So if you look at the uninten unintentional overdoses um, in, across the state in 2016, there was roughly 12 overdoses per 100,000 residents. 
but in Gaston County, we had 20 per 100,000 residents. So not quite double, but way above the national average. And then when you look at our peers that are in Region 4, um, they too are at 12. So what's the difference here in Gaston County? So we were sharing that this is this is a chronic disease and when you look at all of the other county uh, chronic diseases whether it's diabetes heart disease stroke um, heart attacks for whatever reason when you cross into Gaston County and you become a re a lifelong member here all of our health metrics go down so this isn't any different than any of the other entities that we look like um, even when we compare it to our partner and on the south in York County so this is right in line with all of the other health metrics if you look at the um, substances that are contributing to the overdoses, um, this is again going back to 1999, and you will see that opioids have traditionally been on the top, and then heroin just took over um, here in the last couple of years. Now, this is these are the number of times that a drug has been found in the system. Now, it could be that one person overdoses from one drug. You may have a person who their drug screens came back positive for three things when they overdosed. So it doesn't, you know, so that data is a, a summary of all of that. And when you look at the number of Gaston County residents that were treated for opioid overdoses here at our local hospital, uh, we peaked again in 2014 and then those numbers have come down. And we don't have answers for why some of the trends are happening. Some people will argue that that's when Narcan became more readily available out in the field for our first responders. Um, some people will say it's increasing education. We don't truly really know that yet. And then I wanted to share this because of, of the 42 overdoses that happened in 2015, 34 of them happened by accident only eight of them were self-inflicted, which means that somebody intended to commit suicide. So again, you've got to start to understand the, the lingo that the state uses when they're looking at their data. When you look at the drug arrests here in Gaston County, um, you'll see that of, since 2012, we've had a variety of you know, ups and downs with that. Um, heroin leading the charge for the most part over that time period. And of the drug arrests, the majority of that is related to heroin or to other um, narcotics. So using that as a backdrop then, so then we want to know, well, what does a typical overdose victim in Gaston County look like? So again, when you're looking at the opioid epidemic, you're looking at this from two perspectives. So on one hand, we recognize that there is chronic disease, that there's going to be chronic pain. We are not going to outlaw pain medicine. I mean, there is a true place for pain medicine, and there's a true way, a good way to deal with patients that have chronic pain. But on the other hand, the accidental overdoses and stuff, that's happening from a, you know, that's a whole different path. So that's going to be more on the prevention side of the work that we do in the county. So when, so when you're looking at the data we just shared, and as we look forward into the work that we're doing, you want to take a look at it from both perspectives. And yes, we do recognize that things are not that all of these drugs are not legal, but I can tell you, and I'm sure I speak for the other medical providers in our county, when a patient's sitting in front of you and they're admitting to using heroin, I am not worried about the legal side of that. I am worried about them as a patient. I am worried about them accessing the care that they need and explaining to them and helping them understand why we have to do some of the things we do, but I am not going to call, as soon as that patient leaves the office, we are not going to call the police on them. We're not going to call them and make a, a report on their address and stuff. So that is a fine line that we walk when we're dealing with our partners in the community because on one hand, I know they're doing something that's not legal. On the other hand, how do we, how do we do, how do we do our work together so that we're meeting the needs of all the sectors? So some of this data we're going to show you now is specific to the different demographics of the people that have overdosed. Um, and it's going to be for the last, for the time period of 2012 to 2016. So if you look at North Carolina as a whole, um, roughly 85% are white and 11% are, are uh, black. If you look at, I'm sorry, that's the unintention, that's the race of the overdoses that happened in North Carolina. But when you look at Gaston County, as a whole, 75% of the residents in Gaston County are white. But when you look at the overdoses, 97% are white and two out of these years, 100% of the victims were white. Um, 
3% over that time period are black, although the county population, 16% are black. So in Gaston County, um, unlike other counties, this is, I mean, this is um, pretty much a, a problem that we're having in the white race. When we look at the breakdown of sex of the overdose victims, again, in the North Carolina, roughly two men will overdose for every one woman. In Gaston County, there's roughly if, you know, 48 to 52 um, in the general population. When you look at the unintentional doses, though, unlike North Carolina and Gaston County, unfortunately, women are trying to outdo men. And last year, they actually surpassed men in the number of overdoses. So overall in that time period, men were at 58% and 42% were women, but in the last year, I believe 52% of them were actually women. Uh, and then the cost to us as county residents is that for every overdose, um, the lifetime cost of that is gonna be that it's about $400 per, uh, the cost per capita there. So again, um, a lot of information. So if you're looking at the typical person in Gaston County, it's gonna be somebody, it could be a male or a female, they're going to be white, they're going to be of sub, upper socioeconomic status. Um, and for those of us that are in public health, that's not our patients. I mean, our patients are using drugs, um, but in any health metric, how do you avoid death? Well, so in this situation, if we're gonna look at entities and program that we can put in place, this is, why we immediately realized that the collaboration among the providers had to be something that went across all spectrums. It had to involve the private sector because again, I'm an OBGYN by training, so when I talked to, I was just in a meeting yesterday morning and when we were talking about the opioid problem um, here in the community, I reached out to them again and said, look guys, the ladies that are overdosing are not my patients. Are you even asking the question, are you using drugs? And unfortunately they were like, we could do better. So another project for us to take on. Um, but again, so what are we gonna do with this information? So as Dr. Davis um, outlined, you know, you, you now know the history of it. You, know, you now know how the brain, how the drugs are gonna work in the brain, but it's not as simple as just taking drugs. When you are looking at addiction, you are going to have a whole variety of things um, that are going to contribute. Some of it is genetic, some of it is the environment, uh, some of it is the rewiring that occurs in the brain. Uh, we'll see a slide a little bit later that shows, you know, the younger somebody is when they're exposed to these um, drugs, the more likely they are to interfere with the normal development that occurs during puberty. Um, and if you can imagine a baby that's growing in a lady's tummy at the most vulnerable time of their brain growth, if their mom is taking drugs, that's having an impact on the way their brain is developing as well. So. Um, but all of these things are going to interact with each other. So it's not just one thing that we have to target. And again, when you're looking at this, drug use is going to affect everything. You're going to have the addiction and the lifelong problems with that. From a public health perspective, we know that IV drug use is also going to increase the number of um, patients who have hepatitis C and HIV, and we've seen a tremendous increase in that already um, in our county and across the state you're going to have the economic impact of that. Um, and then again, you're going to have um, the social impact of that, whether it's homelessness, whether it's increased um, crime or violence. Um, so there is, again, a multi, it's, it, you're going to have an effect everywhere. So I love this slide, I stole it from somebody else. Um, but basically, you know, when you're looking at this and how are we going to take care of this problem, it's not just one entity that's going to help somebody. Um, you've got to have everything from the medical services in the community available to help them. You've got to have social services in place to be able to help them navigate. You know, a lot of these people lose their housing, they lose their job, they lose their form of uh, transportation. So they've got to have staff available in social services that teach them how to navigate that system again. You've got to have behavioral therapies available for patients. As we just went through the history of this, it's, you know, there are gonna be people that are using this recreationally, um, but for people that are in a long-term um, pattern of use, it's an addiction. So how are we going to help them, you know, navigate through that? And then if we're looking for safe alternatives, so I'll use my pregnant women as an example. When they come into me and they tell me that they're buying heroin on the street, 
Well, my job is to get them into a safe place where they can get medication to treat medication assisted treatment. So we need to give them medications to counteract that. So we have to be aware of all the different drugs that are available for us to safely and legally help them make that transition. So again, in, in treating addiction, we just need to keep our eye on the target there. So our end goal is to make them abstinent or to have them in a treatment program where they are in a stable use of medication. But then the end goal is to make them functional again. Most importantly, within their own family members, within the, you know, in their work, we've, they've got to be employed. And then again, just to become functioning members of our communities. So where do we go from here? Well, first of all, we need to make sure that everybody that needs to know the science understands the science. And after that great um, lesson, everybody in here has now, now understands at the ba most basic of levels um, what's involved with this. But again, if you're in a role where you're supporting the research that's involved with any of this work, um, that's where the advances in science are gonna come from. And then most importantly, we need to erase the stigma of this. I can't tell you how many patients we have that come to us, and even in our conversation yesterday morning, um, patients that are pregnant and seeing you know, a physician, but yet not telling their own doctor that they're using drugs. And then you find out about it when their baby is born and starts going through withdrawal. So patients are embarrassed to tell their doctors that they're having it. Patients are embarrassed to tell somebody that you're my primary doctor and I see you for my flu and my ear infections and in, the, in my high blood pressure, but yet I'm gonna to go to this doctor to get my pain pills. Um, and those doctors don't always know that patients are going to one or two or three or more doctors. So again, reducing the stigma so that the patients themselves will seek the care that they need, but then erasing the stigma as well so that when you identify a family member, a loved one or a friend that needs help, that you're not too embarrassed to go ask for help. So again, if you go back to our demographics, if you are part of the upper socioeconomic status in town, most people are not going to want to admit to their friends that they have a drug problem themselves or in their, in their family. So again, making this a conversation that we can have at the dinner table with our friends um, in our workplaces, but we, we all need to work with the race and the stigma associated with this. So I love this slide um, because this is going to help us transition into the other parts of this. So back in 2012, 2013, when we started looking at this from a community-wide perspective, um, we identified that we have multiple people that are impacted by this, um, whether it is law enforcement, our court system, our providers, our local hospital, um, our faith-based groups. We've got um, syringe exchange programs, social services. I mean, there isn't an agency in town or in this county that probably isn't impacted by this. Because again, somebody, your rapport with somebody is what's going to open that opportunity for somebody to talk to you. So especially in our faith-based community, somebody, you know, a pastor or somebody in a church may be the only person that that person is comfortable relating to. So we wanna make sure that anybody that gets touched by this has the correct information to be able to share um, the information that they have and to make sure that it's the correct information. So multiple people talking about this, but at one point everybody was working in silos. So as the health department, I knew what I needed to do from my agency's, you know, I knew what I needed to do from our perspective to make sure that I was making our state leaders happy with the work that we did. The hospital knew what they needed to do to be able to check their boxes with getting the funding that they get. Every agency had responsibilities. Everybody had a plan for how they were managing that. But by working in silos, there was a lot of duplication of effort. So city councilman Robert Kellogg and roughly about two years ago um, decided to put on a community forum where we could bring the community together to start talking about this. And that was really the first community-wide effort to bring everybody that at that point that was interested in having a conversation about it to the table. And as a result of that community forum, we, the Gasson Community Healthcare Commission decided to make that one of their priorities. And th they basically agreed to sponsor the work that needed to be done across the county to move forward with this. There are, um, out of that work, 
we created this committee that's called the Gas and Control Substance Coalition. And there are several members on the coalition that are here today, um, but I'm happy to see there's so many new people here. Um, but we now, we've been meeting now for not quite two years. So some of the stuff that I'm gonna share with you is an outline of what's happened in roughly about 18 to 20 months. We have 94 committee, committee um, task force members at this point representing at least over 20 agencies. So this is not just the health department, it is not just Caremont, this is truly a community-wide initiative at this point. So this is the org chart for what that looks like. Um, so the coalition now has a steering committee of 11 representatives of a variety of sectors that govern the group of the work that's being done. We started out with four um, committees. We are now down to three committees and two subcommittees. So, uh, but basically, they're divided up into three areas. One committee is focused on the prescribers in the community. One committee is focused on the education and prevention aspect of this work. And then the third committee is focused on treatment linkages. So as you can, if you can recall, you know, most of these patients not only have substance use, but they also have mental health disorders, or they're diabetics, or they're, they've got high blood pressure, they're homeless. Um, so how do you bridge the gap of needing to meet all of those needs? And so, and then the two subcommittees, we've now got a faith-based group that has formed, and then we now have a medication assisted, I'm sorry, a medication take back um, subcommittee that is part of this work as well. So the overall intent is to look across the county to make sure that of the work that's being done, that everybody is consistent in the work that they're doing and that we not duplicate effort. Um, I, I am very proud of past collaborations that we've had in the, in the county where we've pulled together resources and everybody brings something to the table. They may not be able to throw money at, the, at whatever the project is, but if they have staff who can volunteer their time, if they can donate supplies, uh, we work very hard not to duplicate effort. So our mission statement is pretty uh, robust. We actually have developed a strategic plan that's a three-year timeline, and we're roughly about 18 months into that. Um, but as you can see from our mission statement, I mean, we want to prevent the onset of addiction to controlled substances. We want to assure the adoption of safe opioid prescribing uh, practices. We want to deliver comprehensive drug treatment and mental health services for all persons in need. And then we want to deliver professional and community education support of these outcomes. So what I'm going to do is take you through a very high level view for the work that's being done by each committee. So if you can think back to the overall discussion, so a lot of the problem is coming from the prescribing habits from the um, prescribers in our community. So when we first started to look at this, and especially when I was working with our pregnant woman, pregnant women, there is something called the Controlled Substance Registry um, in each state. And so that is a place where I can go look up a patient's name and I can now see where that patient has gotten prescriptions filled and what prescriptions she's had filled. So before this mechanism came into place, I had no idea if, if somebody had gotten pain pills from another doctor. I mean, before electronic medical records went into place, I mean, I could do surgery on a patient and I could get a call from a pharmacist saying, you know, you just gave this patient a prescription for 14 pain pills, but she just got 90 two days ago from Dr. So-and-so in Lake Wiley. I mean, before it was literally hoping that a pharmacist would call you with that information because a lot of times I didn't have access to that information. But now we can go into the controlled substances registry, look up every patient and every variation of their name and every address they've given to a pharmacist, um, and we can look and see you know, what somebody else has prescribed. Uh, we, looked, we rapidly identified that it wasn't just physicians that were prescribers, our dentists, podiatrists, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. So we rapidly went from working with just the doctors to everybody else that was involved with that. So that was a big um, adjustment to that. Over the last five or six years, there have been a lot of changes in different laws or in different guidance issued by either the Center for Disease Control or the CDC um, or federal law or state law that have impacted the way that we prescribe. So when we first looked at this, the first thing we quickly identified is that all of us just needed a refresher course on what did it mean to do, what is, 
how do we safely prescribe? And at the same time, the CDC came out with their new guidance on how we should prescribe in our offices. Um, I went through my medical school training in the early 90s, so a lot has changed in that time period. So we decided as a group that we were going to target all prescribers in our county. And the intent of this work is not that we're going to be punitive. The whole intent of this, I mean, I can tell you based, because of my role and because of collaborations we have with the state, I can tell you who the, high, the top five prescribers are in the county, but none of us have the authority to police each other. That's the job of the North Carolina Medical Board, and they have their own um, practices in place to do that. But on the other hand, as the chair and as with my work dealing with pregnant women, I could use other avenues to go to them and to let them know we have this new training available. How can we help you do things better in your office? So we got feedback from our doctors that they needed a refresher course. We got feedback from them, especially our independents, saying that they needed help in their offices because as a, especially if they're working by themselves, they don't have the time to come up with all of these new forms and contracts and to put these things into place. They didn't have the training to educate their staff members on what to say when a patient calls. Um, they didn't necessarily all have the contracts that they needed to have in their office to go into an agreement with the patient that we're going to go into um, pain medication management. So what we decided to do from, the, from this committee, our primary focus in was to have a continuing medication event, a CME event. Um, we did that in the spring of 2000, no, I'm sorry, October of 2016 and had over 150 different prescribers and people in the medical field that came to that event and had a great overview on what is the current way to safely prescribe uh, medication. Um, and we were happy to see dentists there, podiatrists, um, nurse practitioners, and physicians. So that was great. Um, Caramont hosted a follow-up event to that in June of the next year. So we've now had two events, and our next one is in the planning stage for later this year. We developed templates for all the offices. Um, we have um, also visited all of the pharmacies in town, in, not in town, in the county to make sure that they were aware of the work that we were doing um, to give them referral paperwork so that if they identify somebody who is a frequent flyer or somebody who's possibly seeing one or, you know, one or more physicians, that they could send that information back to us as well. And then in my role as the chairman and as the medical director for our STAR program, that's the Substance Treatment and Rehabilitation Program, where if you are pregnant and using drugs, you can come into our program and we will help you get onto legal medication so that that then gives you a healthier pregnancy and then gives a better outcome to the baby. So by wearing multiple hats with that, that allowed us to visit multiple practices across the town that we knew were high prescribers. And not that they're doing things wrong, that's not our intent, but if you're writing that many prescriptions, also be mindful of the impact that that's having with your colleagues and that if they needed help, that we were there to help them. We gave everybody copies of the new templates. We made them aware of our website and everything. So that has been um, a good, that has been a good overview um, with our community. And I'm happy to say, I think that most of the people now have put um, protocols in place in their offices to help monitor patients and to help them um, safely wean or redo their medications so that they're taking a safer combination of medications. So we've alluded to the fact that there is rewiring that happens in the brain. So I love this slide here. Um, it's from the National Epidemiological Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions. So it's an old slide. It's back from 2013, but the research still shows that the younger somebody is exposed to, whether it's you know tobacco, um, marijuana, or alcohol, the more likely they are to develop an addiction over the course of their lifetime. So again, think of the fact that that kid is going through puberty. There are a lot of physical changes that are happening that you can easily see, but inside their brain, they're still developing. I mean, young women develop faster than men, but even young men are not fully developed until age 21 which explains why some of our teenage boys, when they leave the house, are still acting like teenage boys and they come back as young men um, when they come back to the home. But again, just, you know, their body is continuously evolving. And so when you are giving them um, drugs that can interfere with that normal progression, if something goes off, then, and it doesn't happen with everybody. So 
if you have five kids that are exposed to marijuana, why do two become addicted to drugs and others don't? And again, that goes back to the genetic component. What does your family history bring into the table? Um, but again, if you can see, the earlier they're exposed, um, the more likely they, they are to have a long-term problem. And then for those that are in our school system, so the North Carolina Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, or the YRBS, that is something that is a great tool that the state of North Carolina does. Um, and then we've actually been fortunate to do that here in the county. But this is the students themselves reporting on themselves. It's an, anom an anonymous um, reporting or survey that's done. But roughly 17% of kids across the state are reporting that they have used um, a prescription drug. Doesn't mean it's legal, but they, they got it, and as Dr. Davis said, they were able to obtain it from someone. And then steroids, sniffing glue, and then cocaine or crack. Luckily in Gaston County, um, cocaine is not as big of a problem as it is across the state. In Gaston County, um, heroin and, and opiates are the two biggest um, entities that we have to deal with. So then that goes through, what's the work of the Community Education and Prevention Committee? Because with all of the changes that came through, everybody's fear, especially when the new CDC guidelines came out, a lot of the, because of the work that was now going to be involved in our offices, a lot of doctors decided they weren't gonna write for pain pills anymore. So a lot of patients lost their access to drugs at that time. Um, some doctors just proactively said, okay, I'm gonna start weaning everybody off instead of taking an individual approach to things. Um, so with those changes happening, we felt that it was important for that end, the end user, the consumer, to know some of these changes are happening because of the new guidelines that are coming into place. So it's not, you know, so if you go in and you want a 90-day pill prescription, your doctor may say, no, I can only give you 30 now, whatever their rationale is, and that's because they've interpreted how they're going to apply the new guidelines. So this committee was charged with developing the community campaign theme and content. Um, they are conducting our public information campaign. They are managing our website. Um, after this meeting, I saw a lot of people taking notes and stuff, but our uh, Britain will be sharing the slide sets from, all, from today, um, as well as giving you the link to the website. If you go to our website, it's got all of the data that we've shared and more. I didn't bring all of that with us. It's got resources on there for you know, whether you're a prescriber, a family member, um, it's got all kind of links to great information that's out there. Um, we are doing community presentations. Um, every group that we go and talk to, we bring more and more information back. Um, I've gone to three different Rotary meetings now, and every Rotary meeting, I mean, at one meeting, I had a realtor that said, we've even had to change the way that we do our open houses, because now when we have open houses, people are coming to the open houses to go through people's medicine cabinets. So th they were like, you need to come talk to our association. We're like, okay, we'll add you to the list. Um, at one of the meetings, our county librarian expressed um, interest in us coming because like she said, homeless people are coming into the libraries. They've got you know, kids coming in after school and she felt that the librarians on their staff needed to have access to that information. Um, we've, got the we've got people from the business sector um, pointing out who they think um, we need to go check on. So for instance, I had a community member who, had a pre who has a business um, in a park with a mixed use set of buildings and he was very specific about a doctor's office there that has to be doing something funny because there's too many people going in and out of that parking lot every day. And there's a new pharmacy there now in a non, I guess before it was more of a business um, type of a complex and now there's a pharmacy there and that the same people are going from that doctor's <laughs> office straight to the pharmacy and leaving and he's not happy about it. So people are telling on themselves and each other. I mean so um, so again every time we go out and I was really happy to see that we have new entities here today because again when you are when you see what we're doing and where we need to move forward if there's something that's specific to your agency that's going to be something that we can again we don't care where these patients show up um, or people that need help show up, we want to make sure that we can reach out to them. But again, by doing the community presentations, we get more and more information about what we need here on the ground level. Um, Britain and our other team members are working with our local newspapers, radio stations, and other um, entities to make sure that our message gets shared. 
and then we've started medication take back events. So at each table, we put out um, these great cards that were updated. Um, so basically, this is the current listing of the different sites that are in town where somebody can safely go and drop off medications, and then um, we will dispose of those safely for you. So, and the sheriff's office is a new location on here. Um, so we, you know, we will update this as we add more locations. So on one side, you have the locations. On the other side, you have the items that are accepted and the items that are not accepted. So again, we'll make more available. This is for you. But then um, if your agency would like more to be able to hand out at your different locations, we'll be happy to do that. The other entity that we did um, over the last summer is that we went to two Gastonia Grizzly games. Again, just great crowd to be able to share the message there. And then we were also at the last summer concert event um, in downtown Gastonia, again, sharing the information, giving people the opportunity to um, take advantage of the fact that they could dispose of medication safely. So we threw this slide back in there because, again, most people that have substance use, abuse, most people that have substance abuse also have mental illness. So a lot of people that are using drugs now are using it to self-medicate themselves from a problem that happened for something else. So for instance, again, with my pregnant women, we always, I always feel that it's important to know what started that drug use because that helps us guide what kind of behavioral health help they need. So for instance, one lady was like, well, I started using drugs when my mom committed suicide. Her mom, I mean, that's a tragic event, but she never sought counseling after that. She just started smoking weed, and that went to other things. Um, if you have somebody who has mental health, if they, if they don't have coping skills, um, then they're going to turn to something that's easier for them to use. So it's important to identify what other problem areas they have so that when we try to identify all the resources they need, we're able to do a better job with that. So because of that um, relationship um, and the environmental factors that, that apply to that, so again, what's going to turn somebody towards addiction? The stress in their life, early physical or sexual abuse, witnessing violence, peers who are using drugs, and drug availability. So all of those things added to the genetics, added to the drug supply, added to mental health. I mean, those are a lot of different entities that somebody has to deal with. So that's where the work of the Treatment Linkages Committee comes in. So we had a mental health summit back in June um, where we brought all of the entities that are related to this work um, to the table, brought in an international speaker that lives, eats, and breathes this, who l listened to us, listened to our concerns, and then helped us develop a plan for how we're going to improve with the linkages in our community. We, uh, this committee also advocates for new and expanded opioid treatment services. We are looking for different ways to respond. We've now got a first response team, or we're working on a first response team that's going to work with um, overdose victims that are found in the field and trying to get them into care a little quicker. And then we've established um, a, a support group for family members that have been personally affected by this. So that is all under the work that's being done under this committee. So already in the less than two years that we have actively been working on this together as a community, we have seen very, we've seen several positive outcomes. So neonatal abstinence syndrome is the withdrawal process that a baby goes through when they're born addicted to drugs. So by partnering with our um, pediatricians at the hospital and by working with different um, prescribers in the community, we've been able to decrease the rate of neonatal abstinence um, syndrome in our county by 26% in just the first year and a half. Um, we have a drug diversion and treatment program, which is for repeat offenders. Um, if they decide to go into a treatment program, then they can avoid going into the, back into the legal system. So that program is at capacity and is, has got continued uh, funding for now. We now have an official syringe exchange program in place so that we can exchange dirty needles, uh, clean needles for dirty needles, which will then decrease the rate of hepatitis C and HIV in our community. We have a healthy communities program marketing campaign, which is a partnership with one of our community health educators and 10 other counties to pool money to come up with 
a strategy to get the word out into our um, community better. Our family support group has been established. We've seen a decreased number in our meth lab bust. Our naloxone distribution program is in place, um, either through the local pharmacies or through the different prescribers in our community. And then the formation of the subcommittee focusing on the faith-based groups. So we are already seeing some positive outcomes, but again, we have a long way to go. So on one hand, I wanna thank each person that came here because personally, probably every person in this room is being impacted by this. So if you're not here, you know, so right now, take off your hat of whoever you're representing and just think of yourself personally. I want everybody that's in here to educate themselves on the signs and symptoms of drug use, especially if you've got kids or young adults in your home. I want you to talk to your family members, make the dinner table a, you know, a safe zone where anybody at the dinner table can say and ask anything that they wanna ask you about. Go home and empty out your drug cabinets. I know personally when going through this, I was like, oh my gosh, look at how, that's how old? Um, so again, empty out your drug cabinets. If you feel like you have to keep drugs in your home, please put them under lock and key. Because again, it may not be that your family members are using them, but if you've got young adults and, and kids running in and out of your house like I did for years, they're going through your house. You're not always there. They're going through your house. They're going through cabinets. They're going through places where um, they shouldn't go. Go online and review our work and decide if you want to become um, involved as an individual. Um, if you don't have the time to get involved or don't think that this is right for you, but you'd like to donate to a different charity, then we have multiple pieces of our puzzle that need additional resources. All of us that are part of this have monies that we can contribute to this, but it's never enough. So um, again, we've got different ways that somebody can contribute uh, money. And then again, what's next for our community? So these are some of the things that our coalition wants to do, but then the intent of this afternoon is that we're going to pick your brains to figure out what else we need to do in our community. So we want to expand our medication take back locations, but in order to do that, we have to have more police available to do that because of the chain of command or the chain of evidence that we have to follow with that. Um, but we we're, we're going to continue to work with our pharmacies um, so that more of them. So if you're picking up a prescription, that's a great opportunity to drop off prescriptions that you're no longer using. We want, um, we want, I would personally like to see everybody, you know, we, we have 13 municipalities in our county, we have our county budgets, and then each of our agencies have their own budgets. All of us are impacted with this, whether it's an employee who works for us or it's the work that you're doing is involved with that. So as we are entering budget season, I would love to see everybody add a little bit extra to whatever area you can, you can funnel there. At our last meeting where Barbara and I um, were in Pinehurst in December, um, one of the presenters told us that the federal government has nine federal programs that have money earmarked for substance abuse. And he told us that the Department of Agriculture has the most money. Um, so if you are tied to any of those um, areas, um, look for grant opportunities within your own sector. And you may not know how to use that, but we have plenty of people in the coalition that will help you figure out a plan on how to use those monies um, if they're available. Those of you that have access to elected officials and representatives, whether it's at the county, city, county, state, or national level, please work with them to address the unintended consequences. So an example of an unintended consequence is somebody who works in hospice came to me and said that with the changes in the laws, it used to be that hospice was responsible for the medications that somebody needed at the end of their life. So if they had a patient that entered hospice, they were responsible for figuring out what medications those patients needed. And when the patient passed away, they then collected those medications back and disposed of them correctly. With one of the laws that changed, the medications now became property of the patient's family. So if you can imagine people that are in hospice, a lot of them are taking pain meds. Um, so now hospice is helping them get the meds and then when the patient passes away, they're now packing up the medications to send home with the families. And you're talking about potent medications. So again, that's an unintended consequence of, the, of that law. I can't do anything about it. Chris can't do anything about it, but our elected officials who wrote the law in a way that it was 
either being misinterpreted or unintended can now help us go back and change that. And then the last course is going to be, please speak freely to those of us that are at your table this afternoon. We want to hear your ideas um, because that will help us lay the foundation for the work that we're going to do here over the next few months.